I'm just going to pause for a moment if I can have your attention. Hello? Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Amy. Amy just needs to share a couple of things with us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. So towards the end of the session with Nathan this morning, there'll be a little bit of time for a QA. and a uh, If you have a question that you would like to ask Nathan, we'd ask that you come up the front to what is called the ice cream microphone. And what an ice cream microphone is, it's one that you have to talk right into <laughs> as if you are trying to eat the ice cream. So I'll come and turn that on when it's Q&A time but it's just for the benefit of those who are joining us on Zoom to be able to hear the questions that you're asking of Nathan. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that we have a number of people who have joined us online, which is brilliant, hello. Um, so can we keep the background chatter just to a minimum so that we can hear Nathan clearly and so that we can all um, hear what he has to share with us. Thank you. Ivan Roberts will welcome Nathan and Lisa. Thanks, Ivan. It's really good to be here. I, I came to uh, listen to Nathan and found myself up here introducing him. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons is I, I work with as a resource worker with the UAICC, uh, uh, New South Wales Regional Committee, as a resource person with Pastor Ray Minikin. And we actually were the ones who recruited Nathan, uh, which was a really good move back in 2017. Um, I came to value over the next uh, two or three years uh, Nathan's commitment uh, to the process of reconciliation, but essentially bringing people together uh, in order for us to move forward. Um, I don't know if you've read the, the papers this morning, but there's a little bit of a worry that uh, the voice will be um, a political uh, battle rather than a response of the people. Uh, I'm really envious of Nathan. He was there at the uh, at the conference and the uh, the process in Adelaide to prepare the strategy and so forth for sharing um, commitment to the voice. And we're really fortunate uh, to be able to have Nathan with that direct experience to speak to us today. So Nathan, it was really great when you joined the team, and, uh, and I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Yama, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Ivan. And um, similarly, it was it was great to work with Ivan. Um, most people will know that Ivan's done some some wonderful stuff and has been very supportive over many many years um, of First Peoples. So yeah, the statement from the heart. Um, I'm going to talk just broadly about the statement to start with, just to sort of set the scene a little bit. Um, and explain how that sort of came together. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm going to do um, truth treaty voice. Um, I'm going to talk about it sort of in reverse because I'll only fairly briefly touch on treaty and um, truth uh, and then get into a bit more discussion around the voice, uh, what that is, uh, what it means. Um, I'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the voices you might have heard that um, have some concerns about the voice. Uh, and eventually I'll tell you why I'm really supportive of the voice. So the statement from the heart 2017 um, was preceded by 12 regional dialogues uh, with a number of Aboriginal representatives in the regions coming together to talk about uh, their concerns, needs, aspirations. Um, particularly the focus was around constitutional recognition because the, the discussion around constitutional recognition and how to recognise First Peoples in the constitution had been ongoing through various um, political leadership since about 2010, 2011. There'd been a few committees set up, there'd been research done, there'd been various proposals, but this process was um, had bipartisan support. Uh, it was uh, led by the Referendum Council. It was set up in this model of having 12 regional dialogues to, to consult. 
Um, and you will hear some people say in the Aboriginal community, say, well, I wasn't consulted, I wasn't invited. Um, and that's probably the reality um, because it's probably very difficult to get to every individual person and invite every individual to, to a sort of gathering uh, in terms of that consultation. But it was done, uh, as far as I know, reasonably uh, broadly. Um, it wasn't as though it was just hand-picked people. All sorts of people were invited. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So the 12, the 12 regional dialogues uh, resulted in uh, or culminated in the Constitutional Convention at Yulara. Um, so Yulara is about 25 kilometres from, from Uluru. Um, so, because you will also hear some people say it wasn't even at Uluru, it was at Yulara. So yes, it was at Yulara. There's a, a, a big uh, convention centre there. Over a few days, people met. These, these uh, delegates met, um, they had a lot of discussion. Uh, at one point, there was a, uh, a group that did leave uh, the convention. They weren't happy, they didn't feel that they were being heard. Um, they had some concerns, so they did leave. Um, they, they left, uh, coincidentally, straight into a, a media conference. Um, and if anyone knows about media conferences, they don't just happen. Um, so there was obviously a little bit of planning around what was going to, what they were going to do, and what was going to happen. But I do respect, you know, it is a democracy. People are entitled to have their various views and and that sort of thing. So, but I'm certainly not going to pretend that didn't happen. I think it's important to note that there is a diversity of views on this stuff, on the voice. Um, so if we're just going in reverse a little bit, so I'll start off with truth. So the truth component is about this, what they call a, a Makarata, what they call the Makarata Commission. Um, but essentially it's a, a truth and justice commission similar to, uh, there was a Canadian, uh, I think it was a truth and justice commission or something very similar to that. Um, and what that commission did in Canada was it, it provided over, I think about seven years, the opportunity to talk to uh, Native Canadians about their stories, about things like residential schools and, and the history of colonisation and the impacts of colonisation in Canada. They gathered all those stories together, thought them through and came up with a range of recommendations at the end of that to guide Canada in terms of reconciliation and reparations and how they heal that stuff. So that's an example of how that sort of commission can work. Uh, I also like to think that sort of truth commission would sort of oversight things like curriculum and, and, you know, published works and things just to make sure that, you know, when people are talking about our history, that they're actually doing it in a genuine uh, way, not, not sort of a, a whitewash way or a mythological way or, a you know, sort of we came and everyone was friendly and it was all great and, you know, isn't it wonderful sort of a way um, that we actually acknowledge um, you know, the good stuff about Australian history. Certainly there is a lot of good things that have happened. But, you know, as I also say there, you know, there's some good and there's some ugly. There's some really, really ugly, uh, horrible things that happened. Um, you know, things like massacres, um, you know, oppression, slavery, all those sorts of things happen in this country. And uh, it's, not, it's not about anyone feeling guilty about that stuff, um, unless you've been in a time machine and were back then and you're now here. It's not about feeling guilty because most of us weren't around when a lot of that stuff happened. Some of us might have been when some of it happened. Um, but certainly not to say anyone here, for example, was directly involved in any of that. But what, what truth means is that we acknowledge that history and we also acknowledge the impacts it had and the legacy that that impact has left. So we still have significant disadvantage in our communities, as is um, reflected in the Closing the Gap reports, for example. Um, you know, we have this legacy of dispossession. Uh, we have grief and trauma relating to stolen generations. We still have people alive who were, who were part of the stolen generation and removed as children from their families. So it's about acknowledging that legacy and those impacts and, and the, the real and ongoing impact that that stuff has on an Aboriginal people and communities and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of the truth bit that um, I think we've we've been in a process of getting to anyway in this country over over probably the last couple of decades, but there will be a body that looks after that and oversights that. The other uh, responsibility that that truth commission will have is to help with the negotiation of treaties in that treaty process. That's what the statement sort of talks about. And I'm happy to answer questions a little bit later if anyone has questions around the truth stuff. Um, treaty, 
everyone's probably heard of the treaty issue. Um, I'll just in brief say that uh, as far as I'm aware, and I'm happy to be corrected, but as far as I'm aware, Australia is the only Commonwealth country that does not have a treaty with its First Peoples. Um, treaties exist all around the world in, on all sorts of things. So treaties aren't new, they're not scary. It's basically just a formal agreement that sets out a range of agreed things. So there's nothing to be scared about in a treaty. Um, and in fact, I believe that treaty process is where we will talk about substantive things like sovereignty, land rights, reparations, restorative justice, um, all the things we need to do to put in place to address the past and to be able to heal and enable all parties to move forward, which I think would be a wonderful thing. Some people, uh, I was going to talk about, about people that say treaty should be first. Um, I'll do that when I get to the voice. Um, okay, probably enough about treaty, um, but my, what I would say about voice and treaty and truth is that our Synod, for example, has supported the statement, made a decision uh, thanks to, to John and Amelia for, for putting a proposal up, but we've said, yes, we do support the statement from the heart and we, we support our congregations and presbyteries and Synod to engage with the statement. So by default, that says we support the voice, we support treaty and we support truth. And um, in all that I do, I say like, yes, I support, I support the voice, but I certainly also support treaty and also support truth. They are three things that not one is not any more important than the other. They, they all need to be in the mix together. So just because I say I, I'm supporting yes for the voice doesn't mean I don't absolutely want this country to look at treaty treaties with First Nations peoples. Okay, so the voice. Um, Hopefully people might have seen on the news yesterday that the referendum question has been confirmed uh, and supported by both parties. Um, I don't have the wording in front of me, um, but it's fairly straightforward. Hopefully it's it's not a, a difficult question. Um, I'm just looking up now because what I thought was important about what was read out yesterday was uh, someone I've known for a long time, Tony McAvoy SC, is an Aboriginal barrister. Um, he read out some principles that will underpin the voice mechanism uh, in terms of legislation and how that legislation is created. So I will just find the email that I had sent to myself. Here we go. I do have internet, which is good. While that's just me up. So I'll just talk about the diverse views. So around the voice, okay, I've got it up. So the diverse views, so people might, for example, on Survival Day, uh, a number of us went to Belmore Park to the rally there on the 26th of January. And <clears throat> essentially it was a group of people that were talking about a range of things. They were talking about this in custody, uh, which is a very tragic issue that needs to be addressed in terms of implementation of the Royal Commission recommendations. But they were also very anti-voice and there were three main, main things that came up in terms of their concern about the voice. One was a claim that uh, recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the uh, voice, oh, sorry, in the constitution, thank you. So let's go to the question. Uh, in the constitution will somehow result in the ceding of First Peoples sovereignty. Um, I, I'm a lawyer by background. Um, I've been a staunch advocate for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for the last 30 odd years. Um, my understanding is that international law simply doesn't work that way. Um, it's any, any ceding of sovereignty would inherently need to involve the sovereign party in a negotiated sort of and formally agreed outcome. Mm -hmm. So the Australian government through, through putting a referendum forward, successful or not, um, that doesn't involve Free, fry, free prior and informed consent of the, the state of, of you know, the particular First Nation who, who claims the sovereignty. It's, a referendum simply can't override the sovereignty of a First Nations people. The analogy I, I, I sort of have been using is that, you know, we, we have very close relationships with New Zealand. Um, we have the whole Anzac tradition, et cetera. 
New Zealander our friends, maybe someone suggests, oh, wouldn't it be great to give New Zealand a, a voice to provide advice and guidance to our government in terms of our relations with New Zealand? So we have a referendum to say, should we give New Zealand a voice? We go, yes, New Zealand has a voice. Does that all of a sudden mean that the Australian government can say, oh, by the way, New Zealand, you've ceded your sovereignty to us, thanks? No, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. So while I can understand the fear and, and, and the, the wariness, um, because there's a history that has taught Aboriginal people to be very wary of what government does, um, I honestly and sincerely do not believe there's any sort of stead in this, um, this uh, fear that um, recognition in the constitution will see first people sovereignty. So that's the first one. Again, I do get it. I do get where that fear is coming from, but I, I just wish people would sort of just read a bit more, think it through. Um, hopefully some of the stuff I say along the way helps people think about it. But yeah, the, the sovereignty issue isn't on the table. Sovereignty will be dealt with through treaty process. That's a separate thing and, and will be addressed through treaty. The second thing is that um, the treaty should be first. We don't want this non-binding voice. We want treaty. We want treaty now. This non-binding voice is, is irrelevant. We just want treaty. And again, I get that. I get that Aboriginal peoples, First Peoples have been protesting and marching and rallying and demanding treaty for almost since, you know, for 234 years, pretty much for as long as we realised that treaty was a thing and that we should have one. We've been asking for one. The importance of treaty, um, you know, and then something I like to talk about is when, when the British arrived, you know, the doctrine of terra nullius was applied here, which meant, essentially meant there was no need for a treaty because they sort of pretended no one was here anyway. So you can't have a treaty with someone that doesn't exist, right? Now, through Marbo, we know that terra nullius was unlawfully applied. Um, it was a legal fiction uh, in terms of that there was people here. But if we look at New Zealand, where there was a treaty, um, the British actually did, you know, they did follow the royal instruction that they were under, which was to be amicable with native peoples and to form a treaty. So they did that in New Zealand. And when you form a treaty, what that means is you have to recognise the people that are there, the laws that are there, the customs, like that someone is there. And then you form a treaty and you the, the treaty overlays the new relationship on top of the old situation. So in New Zealand, there's you know, dual language schooling, they've got a dual language national anthem. Um, people I've spoken, I've been to New Zealand, um, people I've spoken in New Zealand, there's, there's a, a sort of a much closer relationship and a, and a much more amicable sort of accepted relationship between first peoples there and second peoples there or, or other, other peoples there, uh, non-first peoples. Um, in Australia, we, we never had that because of terra nullius, because there was never a treaty. Aboriginal peoples have always sort of been either the other or the, on the margins or, or the, the overlooked or the pretend they're not there. Um, and, and this is what sovereignty never ceded is all about because there was never an opportunity through a negotiated treaty at any point in Australia's history, particularly at the front end, where, that, uh, where sovereignty could be ceded. So it has never been ceded because we've never, Aboriginal peoples have never had the opportunity to have that discussion about what that relationship looks like moving forward. The third, the third sort of general area of, of dissent around the voice is just around a general scepticism of government. You know, anything the government does is bad and, you know, we don't trust them, um, you know, because they've, they've basically shafted us so many times in the past. They've told us one thing and done another thing. They've said, trust us, it'll all be right, and then it's not. You know, like, you know, trust us, we're taking your child to a better place. They'll be better looked after. It didn't happen necessarily, you know. Um, so there is this history. There's this real reason why Aboriginal peoples are sceptical and wary of government, which I get. Okay, I'm as sceptical as, as a lot of people when it comes to this stuff. However, at this point in time, we have a government that I believe is genuine, at least in terms of Anthony Albanese. I think he's, he's a genuine guy. He genuinely wants to move this stuff forward. It's potentially, as people have described, a once in a lifetime opportunity to look at, at, at getting this stuff right and to doing something constructive and positive. So as much as I get that weariness and scepticism, I also think we need to try and take opportunities to move forward when they're there. 
And I think this is one of them. And as some, I think Noel Pearson might have said, and maybe others, if not now, when? Do we wait another 100 years? Like, I won't be around. Um, you know, how long do we wait to address this stuff? How long do we wait to have these discussions and to get this stuff moving forward? So that's the, they're the sort of things I hear generally about people that are saying we don't want the voice. Um, sadly, I think a lot of people uh, haven't had a lot of information or they may not understand exactly what's going on or they may be getting information from sources that are similarly a little bit misinformed or misunderstanding of what this stuff's all about. But I respect people's right to have their own opinion. We're a democracy, um, which, you know, for better or for worse, is a good thing. So the principles, um, I'll, I'll just read the question. So um, thank you for whoever it was that gave that to me. So the wording will be uh, 129, chapter 9, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. 129, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. <coughs> Three, the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have the power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander <laughs> voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. Reasonably straightforward. And, and in essence, and this has always been the case, but in essence, what this is making clear is that while we have a broad question in the broad referendum question and a, and a broad constitutional change, the, the actual mechanism and the working and the administrative stuff around the voice, you know, how it will work, what it will, what the processes will be, how much how it gets funded, that stuff will be created through a piece of legislation. And that legislation will have to go through our parliamentary process, as does every other piece of legislation. So those politicians that are saying we need more, we need more detail, will be the same politicians that are responsible for creating the detail. Okay, so think about that. So if you're actually one of the ones that's going to be sitting in, in either the lower upper house of parliament working through this piece of legislation and being able to comment on it and make suggestions and say, no, I don't like that bit, I want it changed. You're creating the detail. So to then be sitting prior to that process saying, oh, I don't know what the detail is, I haven't got enough detail. It's a bit disingenuous, I think. So just, just think that through when you hear these particular people saying we don't have enough detail. And, you know, while I haven't read the full 273-page um, Calma Langton report, um, final report around recommendations for the voice, um, I've read the executive summary, bits and pieces through it, and looked at the recommendations. And there's quite a lot of detail in that. And while some politicians would say, oh, that's just recommendations, we've now got to the point where we have these principles. So the principles that will underpin the development of the voice body and the, the legislation include the voice will give independent advice to the parliament and the government. And then there's a few dot points I'll read through. The voice would make representations to the parliament and the executive government on matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The voice would be able to make representations proactively. The voice would be able to respond to requests for representations from the parliament and the executive government. The voice will be independent and have its own resources to allow it to research, develop and make representations. The parliament and executive government should seek re representations in writing from the voice early in the development of proposed laws and policies. Pretty straightforward. Nothing scary, I don't think, in it. B, it will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. So the dot points, members of the voice would be selected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities not appointed by the executive government. Members would serve on the voice for a fixed period of time to ensure regular accountability to their communities. And lastly, to ensure cultural legitimacy, 
the way that members of the voice are chosen would suit the wishes of local communities and would be determined through the post-referendum process. C. Will be represented, the voice will be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, gender balanced and include youth. Members of the voice will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander according to the standard three-part test. Three-part test of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent recognised by their community, their Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community and self-identify as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person. So that test has been around at least since 1983 in the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act. It generally works well. And the thing that does frustrate me, frustrate me I'll just digress a little bit, but um, there's often this issue of people saying, oh, but you know, people, people are uh, you know, saying they're Aboriginal and they're not, as though that's an Aboriginal issue. That's not an Aboriginal issue. That is an issue of non-Aboriginal fraud because it's a non-Aboriginal person committing fraud saying there's something that they're not usually to try and get a benefit. Okay, so that's not an Aboriginal issue. That's a, like a, a non-Aboriginal fraud issue. So just when people talk about that stuff, just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. Members would be chosen from each of the states, territories and Torres Strait Islands. The voice would have specific remote representation as well as representation from the mainland Torres Strait Islander population and the voice will have balanced gender representation at the national level. You may have heard certain senators, Senator, <laughs> talking about um, that, oh, it'll just be these, these Aboriginal elite people from, from Sydney and the Eastern States. Not true. Never been true, it's not true. It will be a representative um, body from across the country, including the Torres Straits, including a gender balance, and including young people. It's not just the usual suspects from Sydney or Canberra. Yeah. And, and they're not appointed by the, the government. They're selected by our communities for our communities. So the voice will be empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, and culturally informed. The dot points. Members of the voice would be expected to connect with and reflect the wishes of their communities. The voice would consult with grassroots communities and regional entities to ensure its representations are informed by their experience, including the experience of those who have been historically excluded from participation. So, for example, you might have heard people say, oh, we've already got voices. We've already got politicians, you know, in Canberra. We've already got um, the Coalition of People, Aboriginal Organisations in New South Wales. We've already got NACHO, the health body. Yep, we do. Um, we also have the status quo that we've got at the moment. So not, not that those, those organisations and voices aren't trying their absolute hardest to get their messages through, but the voice will give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including the voices of those organisations, a, a seat at the table, a permanent seat at the table. So the voice can actually champion the voices of those bodies directly in. Okay, so um, yeah, if you hear people say, oh, we've already got all these voices, so yeah, and, and the voice can help to champion and, and raise loudly those voices to the ears that need to hear them. They don't have to be writing to, you know, from out here to try to get a meeting, to try to, so like the voice will have a seat at the table. It will have a direct line uh, to, to offer that advice and guidance. So the voice will be accountable and transparent. The voice would be subject to standard governance and reporting requirements to ensure transparency and accountability. No one would expect any less. I, I added that bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should just clarify. People are taking notes of this one. See that. Um, okay. Um, voice members would fall within the scope of the National Anti Corruption Commission. Uh, voice members would be able to be sanctioned or removed for serious misconduct again. Mm -hmm. Half of the course, we wouldn't expect anything less. Uh, we're up to F. The voice would work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. Uh, the voice would respect the work of all existing organisations, a bit like I was saying about that. Six, the voice will not have a program delivery function. The voice would be able to make representations about and propose efficiencies for programs and funding, but it would not manage money or deliver services. So it's just an advice and guidance body 
It's not actually going to be running any programs or have program funding and do all that sort of stuff. It will simply advise government and, and also potentially our own organisations if our own organisations ask for it, but certainly we advise, advise government about how existing programs are to be developed, implemented, oversighted, staffed, managed, all that sort of stuff. And lastly, and very importantly, the voice will not have a veto power. So for those who will remember uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, then Prime Minister, rejecting outright the statement from the heart saying, uh, it's a third chamber of parliament and I won't be having a bar of it. Um, someone has told me that um, Malcolm has since um, withdrawn that sort of position and apologised for that position, which is very lovely of him. Um, but yeah, this, this, the voice body won't have any power to direct or dictate or tell or direct the parliament to do anything. It will simply be able to say, you know, we would recommend or we would advise or, you know, our guidance would be that this is the particular path you should take or the action you should take or the policy direction you should take. Um, the government will still have the opportunity to say, yeah, thanks, but we want to do this. Now, for some Aboriginal people, that's really frustrating. It's like, well, what's the point? Initially, when I heard about the voice and it being non-binding, I'll be honest, I was a bit anti-voice. I was a bit like, well, what's the point? You know, like if, you know, it's, it's just token, all right? But, and I was also thinking at that stage about, uh, for example, if anyone's looked at the human, uh, sorry, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in that uh, declaration, there's an Article 19, which talks about the right of Indigenous peoples to not consent to legislation and or regulations that, are, that will impact them, that are in, going to be introduced by the state, by, by the government of that particular country. So I talk about, for example, if, if that Article 19 right to not consent was in play in Australia, when the Northern Territory intervention was proposed, those communities that were impacted by that, who felt very strongly that it was going to have negative impacts and it wasn't appropriate, could have said, we, uh, we rely on our Article 19 right to not consent to this and we're not, we're not consenting and you can apply it to other places if you want, but it's, that's not for us. We think it's going to negatively impact our community. Um, and so you need to go back to the drawing board and tweak it or do something that we can agree to that we think is, is okay for our community. So that, that Article 19 right, uh, human right, is not reflected in the voice. However, the voice guidance, so, so the, the advice and guidance that is issued from the voice body to the government, as far as I'm aware, will be on public record. So all of our wonderful Australians who are hopefully going to vote yes in the referendum and support this body and support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people having a voice to parliament and to the government will be able to look at this advice and be able to see this advice. They'll also be able to see how the government of the day responds to that advice and how the parliament responds to that advice. And, you know, if the government or the parliament doesn't respond well or does things that are a bit sort of on the nose, um, those, those politicians are accountable to their electorates and to the Australian people. So I would hope that all those wonderful people who vote yes and support this are going to be keeping a bit of an eye on what's going on. And if the politicians that you've previously elected aren't doing the right thing, well, you can vote them out of the next election. So there is a level of accountability here. It's not just something that's going to happen off in the ether and no one's going to know what's going on. It will be quite public. So there is a level of public accountability in this process. And it's not as though the voice won't have any power at all. It will have power, it will have power to inform, it will have power to inform the Australian public, and it will have power to potentially influence elections. So keep that in mind as we go forward and you know, when, when it comes time to vote for different things. Something that someone said recently to me about the voice was they said, you know, if the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Hotels Association, Australian Farmers Federation, all these other groups have got very powerful lobby, lobby groups. They're very powerful lobbyists. They employ people to constantly give advice and guidance 
to politicians and the government, you know, to try and influence the way legislation is created and developed, the way policy is developed and applied. All these other big in, uh, industry groups have got lobby groups. The voice is sort of like an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lobby group. So it's similarly to the way that, you know, the, the ACTU can't force the government to do things, it can certainly talk to the government and say, the, this is the interest of our members, this is what we'd like to see happen, and you know, it may happen, it may not. Um, so why shouldn't Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a similar ability to lobby? Um, not to be able to direct, not to be able to force, but to simply say, this is our advice and guidance on what we think will work best in this particular situation. For me, it's like, well, of course we should. Of course we should that, have that ability. Um, in terms of um, broadly the church's position, I think I've mentioned that the assembly uh, has recently uh, said that they support the yes uh, vote in the in the referendum. Um, National Uniting Aboriginal and Christian Congress, and UARCC or Congress, have said they also support the yes vote. Um, Congress have similarly to me acknowledged that there are diverse voices, but as a group, they have supported the yes vote. Um, the uniting, um, so our uniting New South Wales ACT, Community Services and Advocacy Body, the Board of Uniting has um, decided to support the voice. So uniting is, as an organisation, is supporting the yes vote. Um, Recognising that within uniting, there will be, you know, staff will have various opinions, but as an organisation, they are supporting it. So I think, and as far as I'm aware, every other synod, apart from, I think, Queensland, who are still deciding, they may have decided in the last week, I'm not sure, but as far as I know, every other synod is also supporting the yes vote, um, which is great, which is great. Um, I'll save Jane from asking a question, but Jane has said, when are we going to get shirts like this with the, with the, our, our logo on it, with the Uniting Church logo on it? And I said, hopefully soon, so I'll work on that. From my point of view personally, um, yeah, look, I think I've really thought it through. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not easily swayed. And as I said, I'm a lawyer. I'm quite analytical by by nature and by training. Um, I've thought this stuff through. I see uh, the voice as a first step in the right direction. I was going to mention this earlier and I forgot. So, in terms of the sequencing, voice, treaty, truth. I read an article by Megan Davis um, that you should be able to find if you want to Google it, I think it was written in 2017, um, co-written with a, another lady, I think. And in this article, Megan talks about the fact that in those 12 regional dialogues, what came up that was a bit unexpected was that um, a lot of those representatives from their communities were really concerned about the funding situation. So the Commonwealth funding situation, which had changed in fairly recent times then, to what, what's known as the IAS or the, I think it's the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. And what that particular funding process and strategy meant was that the, the application process was sort of streamlined, but also very complex. So a lot of Aboriginal organisations that didn't employ expert grant writers um, lost out to the big NGOs. So, you know, uh, I won't name them, but um, we all know who those big NGO providers are um, because they employ expert grant writers. That's you know they employ people whose specific job is to get is to write these things and get money. So what that actually meant for communities was that these bigger NGOs sort of came into town to take over these service delivery things programs. It meant the trust relationships that the local community organisations had had weren't there in these new arrangements. It meant that the Aboriginal people from local communities that were employed in those programs to deliver those services lost their jobs. Very significant. Um, and yet yeah, it caused a lot of a lot of frustration and a lot of anger and concern. So a lot of these delegates in the regional dialogues, apparently, according to this article, um, were raising concerns about this funding situation and saying we want the chance to go and talk to the government about what's going on with this with this policy and this funding because um, it was critical. You know, people losing jobs, communities aren't getting the, the culturally appropriate services, etc. So for that reason, or that was one of the main reasons why the voice was put first and treaty second. Again, not that treaty is any less important, and Megan Davis makes the point to say that. 
the the voice treaty truth wasn't saying that voice is most important treaty is sort of half important and the truth stuff's not really that important all of the three things are equally important but at the end of the day the dialogue said we want this voice to parliament so we can address particularly this funding stuff but other things On the way down, I was talking to, to my wonderful partner, who I won't point out, but um, she's up the back. Um, and we were talking, and I was saying that one of the things about the Uluru Statement from the Heart was that the, the conveners uh, were going to the Referendum Council, were going to issue it to politicians. Yeah, they're going to issue it to Anthony Albanese. And, but they got to a point and they realised that, you know, things like the Barunga Statement, um, uh, Yukala Bark Petition, a Kirribilli Statement, and various other statements and petitions that had been made by Aboriginal people over many, many years and decades that had been given to politicians, to handed to Prime Ministers. Most of them are now sitting in cabinets as sort of artworks in Parliament House. Mm -hmm. They didn't work. They were like, oh, thanks for that. We'll have a look. Thanks. Oh, isn't it pretty? We'll stick it up there. Yeah. So the Uluru Statement from the Heart was read to camera, I think it was by Megan Davis, um, and it was addressed to the Australian people. It wasn't addressed to the politicians. It was addressed to the Australian people. It was a call to the Australian people and an invitation to join in this, in this work and to move this stuff forward. In recognition of it's the Australian people who are going to vote in a referendum. It's the Australian people who elect our politicians. It's the Australian people that in our democracy have the power, ultimately. So that's why it was read that way. So, and I think, and Lisa, Lisa sort of said, oh, I didn't know that, that's important. So in case any of you didn't know that, that was why it was done that way. So how am I going for time? Is it about question? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so look, I'm voting yes. Um, as I said, like I've really thought it through. I'm an Aboriginal person, I'm an Aboriginal lawyer. I'm, you know, I've protested, I've marched, I've, I've you know, worked for the Anti-Discrimination Board and, and defended rights of Aboriginal peoples for 30 odd years, um, and I'm voting yes. And I would really encourage all of you to certainly read, listen, you know, keep up to speed with what's going on, but I would encourage you all to also vote yes. Thank you. <laughs> And, now and I will say it's a safe space, so you can ask me anything you like. Don't feel you can't ask. I had two questions. Where should I look? Maybe, maybe the people on camera. The camera can't find two questions. You right my first one's partly answered. Where can I get a yes t shirt? <laughs> uh, second one is I'm going to be brave and engage people in our church. We're all we're all different, and I'm ready for somebody to say that's po political. How like church and politics don't mix. So what what will I say next? I think. My, my gut response is to say I think Jesus might disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think he might disagree. I think I think a lot of Jesus's life was impacted by politics, particularly at the end of it. Um, look, the reality is, um, as an Aboriginal person, my daily life is political um, because so much of my 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 own well-being, my family's well-being, and my community's well-being depends on the on the actions and decisions of politicians, the programs that are run, the services that are provided, um, how we're treated. All sorts of things. Our the lives of Aboriginal people are inherently political, even even though we don't want them to be. We wish we could just get on with it, which is hopefully after Voice Treaty Truth, we get that stuff sorted. Hopefully, we can all eventually move on and get on with the other fun things in life. But um, the Uniting Church is also um, a church on the way. It was always considered that this church would be moving forward. That's why we're not called the United Church. We're called the Uniting Church because we're on the way. Our church is fundamentally a socially social justice oriented church. We believe in those things. Um, personally, uh, in my faith, I like to think that Jesus was the original social justice warrior. 
You know, he was concerned about the other. He was concerned about the people on the margins. He was concerned about the weak and the oppressed. He was concerned about the impact of authority on the everyday person. So as, as members of the Uniting Church, um, while it may be a bit political, it's, it's sort of like saying, you know, being that, being the good Samaritan, oh, that was a bit political. Yeah, you know, you know, well, well, the priest didn't do it, and the Levite didn't do it, and people that, that were the, the the probably more more powerful and respected people in the community didn't stop and help, but the Levite did. The Levite was probably not. Um, <laughs> sorry, Samaritan. <laughs> the priest and the Levite went. Sorry, I'm thinking it's like a priest and the Levite went. Samaritan stopped. It is the good Samaritan story. Um, so, so I think you know. It's, it's not so much about being political as it is about social justice and doing what's right. You know, it's the Good Samaritan story. It's, it's the Matthew 25, 31 to 46 story of the sheep and the goats. How do we treat the least in our community? Ultimately, we're not going to be judged on how wealthy or big our church is. We're going to be judged on how we treat the least in our society. You look at the Closing the Gap report, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people broadly, generally, are the least. You know, socioeconomically, our statistics are, are you know, they just show the, the broad disadvantage um, and the margins where Aboriginal people live in. You know, housing, health, employment, overrepresentation, deaths in custody, like a whole range of things where Aboriginal people are just fighting this fight to survive uh, on the margins and feeling a bit like the other and that we're, we're sort of not seen and not heard. So I would suggest that it's not it's not about politics, it's about faith. I hope that answers it. And that's just my personal view. We have a question from online. Uh, just one second, John. What does sovereignty mean and what are its legal ramifications? Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> so look, sovereignty, I mean, a lot of people think of sovereignty in terms of, for example, in, in the, the, the English sense, you know, the, the monarchy, you know, the king or the queen is the sovereign head of state. Um, they, you know, the sovereign power controls the land and all the in. Um, in an Aboriginal cultural sense, sovereignty is about custodianship and care for country. It's about looking after it's about a really complex relationship with, you know, land and animals and the environment where it's a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, Aboriginal people survived for 60 odd thousand years in a very sustainable way. Think about what's happened in this country in the last 200 odd years. Think about all the fish in India. I would struggle to believe that that would have ever happened in the 60,000 years prior to colonisation. Mm -hmm. So sovereignty for Aboriginal people is this, this <laughs> mutual relationship and link with land. Um, land is part of culture, it's part of heritage, it's part of law, it's part of our spirituality, it's intrinsically part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though, you know, and, and the difference in, in views of sovereignty are simply differences in cultural perspectives and cultural worldviews. So, you know, a Western concept of land might be around land as an asset, land as a power base, land as a resource to provide an income. <coughs> From an Aboriginal perspective, land is about sustainability and mutual respect and caring and that relationship. But it's, I think it's it's a bit disingenuous for people to say, oh, but because Aboriginal people don't think they own the land, they're not, there's no sovereignty there. It's that's not the case. Like, um, you know, if if potentially like if you take, I've got to be careful how I word this, but and I mean well, but you know, if you take some land off a non-Aboriginal person um, or they sell it, they move on, they buy something else, or they spend the money on something else. If you take land off Aboriginal people, it breaks their connection to traditional country. It breaks their connection to, to ceremony, to law, to, you know, this, this ancient culture. Um, it would be like if, I'm trying to, you know, it'd be like if someone said, all right, well, you guys, you can't use this church anymore. It's, it's not yours, we're taking it off you. 
you know, there would be a lot of grief, there would be a lot of trauma, there'd be a lot of, but hang on, but we that that's part of who we are, that's where we worship, that's where our, our spirituality uh, is expressed. So to take land off Aboriginal people, it's a similar sort of a thing. So I hope that sort of explains it. Uh, it wasn't particularly a legal definition, but hopefully that gives an idea of, yeah. Just talk straight down the microphone, John. Okay. Um, the referendum in question includes phrase uh, representations to Parliament and to executive government. Now, I've just forgotten what executive government means. So, could you explain that to us and why are those words included? Is, is it in a sense bypassing, does it root the bypassing Parliament? Now, so what, what the, the executive government is effectively the government that's in power. So the executive government at the moment would be the Albanese government because they have the numbers, they have, they're, the, they're the government that essentially executes uh, the will of the parliament and um, yeah, that sort of stuff. So, so there's the executive government, which is the parliament, the, the party that's in power effectively. And then there's the parliament, which is the lower and upper house and that mechanism that approves legislation and things like that. So that's the, the difference. They just, the, the clarification, I think, was just to make that really clear that the voice will have the ability both to advise, give advice to the executive government, so at the moment the Albanese government, uh, and to the cabinet, uh, Labor cabinet, and also to parliament broadly. In that space, just to acknowledge that the executive, that um, as the Albanese government can do bits and pieces quite apart from legislation. That goes through Parliament. Um, so it's to capture all of the power that government can have so that they're exercising an executive power. Um, the government does some things that don't need to go through Parliament. Um, so it captures all of what government can do. Thanks, Andrew. Yes. Much better put than <laughs> the uh, Thank you, Nathan, for such an eloquent uh, presentation. I really have a number of comments uh, derived from long study of uh, these matters. As a historian, uh, a large part of my career has been teaching Aboriginal Australian history. Um, and let me say at the beginning that it is very, my very firm intention to vote yes. Thank you. Um, but there are a few comments. Firstly, I think there's a great deal of sloppy understanding of Australian history including Aboriginal Australian history and our constitution in a lot of what's talked uh, and very commonly put around. And I don't agree with a number of uh, thing, number of points that you've made this morning, but there's no point in talking about those in detail. We can chat later. Um, <laughs> the, I would emphasize the great difficulty that there's going to be in realizing the voice uh, should it get up in the council. Uh, in, the, in the referendum. Uh, as the body settles down, I think there are going to be a number of difficulties. One that I have to say concerns me uh, in terms of my personal view of identity is that I think the question of establishing Aboriginal Indigenous identity is going to be much more difficult than people realised for a few people. I don't agree that the three-part test is successful uh, and it hasn't been in the courts to date, of course. But the important thing about the voice, it seems to me, is that it's the present day presentation of policy between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians and other Australians. Now, this, this policy or these series of policies have a very long history way before 1788. Australia did not begin in 1788. European Australia began in 1606. And lots of people were thinking about Australia and Aborigines before 1788. But this process has gone on and it seems to me that the, the voice if it gets up will be a useful addition to these policies. And a present day, uh, present uh, determination about policies towards uh, each other. Uh, so I would urge people to vote yes for this. The other sign is to vote no 
is, I think, to create all sorts of difficulty in much wider processes that are under underway in the society. Uh, it would call a vote, and if the referendum fails, it will cause untold difficulties. But voting yes is worthwhile, if only to promote all these other processes that are going on, good processes in Australian society to get today. So thank you. Thank you. And look, certainly, um, you know, Aboriginal people were having international sort of diplomatic relationships with people from Indonesia, the Dutch, um, and a range of people prior to uh, 1788, um, which is interesting. I often like to talk to, to people about that in terms of, you know, Aboriginal people were not this sort of noble savage. We had international relations. We had diplomatic relationships and trading relationships with other countries. Um, people, you might see on social media, sometimes people say, oh, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for white people, you wouldn't have televisions and fridges. And if you haven't seen that, it does happen. People say that. Um, but what I like to say is that, look, we were trading with Asia well before the British got here. Right? Asian people made pretty good TVs and fridges. So I reckon we would have. <laughs> uh, anyway, I digress. I digress. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan, thanks for the information you've given us uh, so far. I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced, and I will be voting yes, resounding yes. But my question is more about uh, the truth telling side of the trilogy, I suppose. Do you see any, any uh, similarities between? What you see is a truth-telling side of it to the uh, South Africa's experience from truth-telling after apartheid, which seems to me to be the most the most searing of truth-telling that I can recall in my lifetime. Um, look, I, you know, I'll I'll admit I'm not you know fully over what happened in South Africa, um, but certainly I know that that the, the truth and justice and the reconciliation, the notion of reconciliation um, certainly came to the fore through that, that process in South Africa. Um, it certainly, there's gonna be some difficult and challenging times ahead in terms of as we as a nation come to terms with things that, you know, there will be things that have happened that I don't know about. You know, I, I'm reasonably aware of a lot of things um, through just through research and, and reading, but, I'm sure there will be some stories that come out in due course um, that very few people are currently aware about that will might shock, shock us. Um, in terms of what was mentioned earlier about uh, the challenges of the, the voice referendum and, and it might be difficult to get up, 100% um, this is gonna be a difficult process. It's not, it's not a given. It's not, there's, there's no sort of, um, just acceptance that this is this is a done deal. So the referendum will require a majority of Australians to vote yes. That may or may not happen. Uh, people occasionally say to me, but how will Aboriginal people feel if, if people vote no, if the no gets up? I think a lot of Aboriginal people, and I think a lot of non-Aboriginal people will be very disappointed in that result. However, I, I often think, a lot of non-Aboriginal people probably don't understand that Aboriginal people have been used to getting the raw deal and the bad outcome for decades and centuries. We're pretty resilient. We're used to fighting. We're used to getting knocked back and getting back up again. Um, so it, I think they will be disappointed, but for a lot of Aboriginal people, it might be just, yeah, I figured that would happen, you know, sadly, sadly. So I don't want that to be the case. You know, I want I want this to be a good outcome, and I want want us to be able to move forward as a nation. Similarly, if you think that the voice discussion is difficult, wait till we get to treaty. <laughs> wait till we get to treaty. This is where we are going to be talking about things like Article Nineteen rights, about a right to not consent. We're going to be talking about sovereignty. We're going to be talking about land back. Um, I will allay people's fears. My understanding and, and best guess is that what we would be talking about in terms of land would be very similar to other land rights processes at the moment, which is predominantly unused crown land. In terms of a treaty, potentially crown land, not privately owned land. 
Okay, so don't stress that someone's backyard isn't safe as what happened and was going around after the Marbo decision. Um, post Marbo, has anyone had their backyard taken? No. Okay, certainly there's been native title, certainly there's been handback of unused crown land through, for example, the New South Wales Land Rights Act and the relevant land claim process there, but private land is basically not, not up for, for grabs. But yeah, the, the treaty process is, you know, and someone said to me, oh, how long do you think that will take? And I said it could take 10 years. And they went, 10 years? I said, yeah, but if we started it 10 years ago, we'd be there. <laughs> so we have to start the discussion and the dialogue somewhere. And it will take time. And yes, there are many, potentially hundreds of Aboriginal nations, a bit like you've got the map of Europe and you've got you know, England, Poland, all the different European nations on that continent. We have all of our nations on this continent. And there you know, potentially will be a need for an overarching treaty and then potentially a provision to have sub-treaties to actually talk to each First Nation in terms of what are your needs and aspirations and what's restorative justice look like for you and your community. Long process, going to be difficult. You know, going to be very difficult, but that's our challenge as a nation. That's something we need to work through. We need to we need to get to the other end of that um, to be able to move forward as a nation for healing to occur and you know, to put this stuff sort of behind us and move forward. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. I want to ask about t-shirts. <laughs> I'll work on it. Two points: one for clarification, because the two paragraphs that you read out, uh, and Andrew was right about. Um, being able to advise to the executive that can do things that don't have to go to parliament. But actually, the second part of that paragraph is more important because previous advisory councils and it could only advise to the executive government. They couldn't take things to the wider parliament and advise people of the opposition party. So this means that the voice would have a voice to all of us. And it guarantees that. So every previous advisory council could only advise to government. Thanks. Because they were appointed by government. So that's number one. Number two is my question. I had the privilege of working in attorney generals during the Mabo. Um, uh, and uh, one of the significant things after the terrorist knowledge was thrown out was nothing was put in its place. So my question is, if you don't recognize First Peoples in the Constitution in the first place, then you can't have a conversation about treaty and about justice. Is that right? Or, I mean, I see a hierarchy in that, in that sense, because first there must be some recognition. Yeah. Is that... Look, I, I think, I think it's, I think that's right. I think it's important to recognise First Peoples um, because that recognition didn't occur originally. Um, there's also, I suppose, on the other end, there's also an argument that often some First Nations, like traditional owners, put up, which is that, you know, so our sovereignty has never been ceded, therefore we exist as a sovereign entity, therefore we have a right as sovereigns to negotiate in our own, on our own behalf with the other sovereign state. So there's no need to actually recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution in, able for, in order for those two sovereign states to form a treaty. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily interdependent. Um, I think the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution is just a, a very respectful and sort of a bit of a no-brainer. It is making up for some of that non-recognition previously, but I think that recognition combined with a seat at the table in terms of the voice body um, is, is much better than just saying we acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are first peoples. I think having that seat at the table is, is a more genuine form of, of respectful recognition. So, yeah. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Wright. I'm from uh, Wesley United. Uh, Nathan, thanks for coming um, and presenting to us um, your comment on imagine if it had started 10 years ago, where we'd be. Imagine if it had started in 1967. Um, True. So my my question is is a bit broader. Um, as you know, a member of uh, the Presbytery. Um, speaking to someone from Congress, how can we best support Congress um, not only in this path, but is there something that, for instance, from the memorandum of understanding with the Synod um, that we could be doing 
to help Congress uh, from here going forwards, um, go through this and in a broader sense. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Um, the, the one of the fundamental things I think about our relationship, the, you know, our relationship with Congress is that we, you know, it's very, very important that church respects Congress's right to self-determination and to um, determine what its own needs and aspirations are and how it represents its members and, and our communities more broadly. Um, so from a synod perspective, for example, um, you know, I've got a good relationship with, with uh, Reverend Mark Kickett, interim chair, uh, Alison Overing, and certainly some members of um, you know, Tommy Sloan and uh, Beth Wolfe. Um, who are our ministry centres in New South Wales. Um, so where Synod is there, we have do have a mem memorandum of understanding that sort of defines what, you know, what Synod's responsibilities are, what the presbytery, relevant presbytery's responsibilities are, and what Congress's responsibilities are, and how we'll meet and how we'll report to each other and things like that. Um, the Synod certainly um, does provide um, sort of operational financial support for the Congress ministry centres. Um, I think one of the ways that um, both congregations and presbyteries, for example, can support Congress is, is through the in-kind sort of stuff. Um, like certainly financial support is wonderful, but um, Congress, Congress, for example, you know, Tom and Beth, wonderful, beautiful people, very focused on supporting their local communities. They're not, they're not strategists. They're not business planners. They're not, you know, five-year planners. Their, their, their focus is on the everyday lives and crisis and what's going on in their communities and providing pastoral care and ministry support. So, but across our congregations and our presbyteries and synod, we have a lot of expertise. Um, so if and when Congress, for example, might reach out or might express a need for support in those sorts of areas, could be legal advice, could be financial planning advice, could be business strategy, could be invest, I don't, you know, whatever it is, you know, I've got UFS sitting up there that can probably give some good advice. Um, you need to have a license for that, by the way. I just, um, my background working for ASIC. Um, but yeah, so so there's probably a lot of a lot of good um, res resources in terms of that that in-kind support and advice that we might better help Congress with. But Congress is actually holding its national conference next month. Um, in April, mid-April, up in Darwin, um, Congress Congress is aware that you know it's sort of a new era uh, in a lot of ways. It's we're not we're not in 1985 anymore. You know, it's like we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, things have changed. You know, we are post royal commission. You know, which changed things for the landscape of the church. You know, we have safe church with a whole lot of regulations that we have to follow certain requirements. It's not sort of the, the sort of bit laissez-faire sort of style it used to be. So Congress is aware of that. They're aware of the need for good governance. They're aware of the need for sort of risk management and those sorts of things, at least at a sort of a national level. And they're aware of the need to, to work through those things and address those things as a, as a national organisation. So my understanding is that this conference will be focused in part on some of those questions and those issues and how Congress works through those things. I would like to think that that process, it probably won't all be done in the five or six days that uh, the conference is on in Darwin. The national executive will probably be given some uh, direction to follow some things through and to, to do some further work. But um, however we can as a church, however we can as a presbytery, as a synod, as, a, as congregations, however we can lend moral, in-kind expertise financial support to help Congress go on that journey, I would encourage everyone to take every opportunity to do that. Um, because yeah, Congress needs our support. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Uh, again, um, I uh, have had the privilege the last two weeks of hearing from you in our formation classes at UTC. Uh, so it's been good to kind of share that with everyone here as well. Um, main question is around uh, resourcing. Yeah. And are you aware of any uh, plans from assembly or synod to actually resource respiratories and congregations to have these conversations leading up to the referendum? Because mm -hmm. I know that there will be questions in my congregation 
Yep, and I'm sure that there will be questions in your congregations as well. Um, so I'd be keen to know, um, yeah, whether there's going to be any, any study guides or any, yep. yeah, things like that. Good question. Thank you. Um, probably I should have mentioned this earlier. So certainly there will be some resources um, that will be uh, put up on the Synod's First Nations Resources website. And for any of you who don't know about that website, if you Google First Nations Resources UCA, the first link that comes up should be a link to that website. So there's actually a whole lot of resources on that website. Um, some historical stuff, um, things about acknowledgement of country, some assembly resources, a copy of the Walking Together Action Plan, you can access there. A uh, copy, of, I've, I've written a, a guide to um, building relationships, no, a guide to community engagement and building trust relationships with Aboriginal communities. So that's on there. If anyone's interested in like, how do I go about actually meeting and in introducing myself and building a relationship with the local Aboriginal community. There's sort of some hints and tips in there. Um, so yes, we will be putting some resources on there. Um, I've actually currently got in a Word document a fairly comprehensive list of the various websites and links and some articles and videos. Um, and that will be going on to the First Nations Resources website. There's a website called, I think it's called Yes23. So if you Google Yes23, that's the From the Heart Yes Campaign Group's website. And there is a whole lot of um, information and resources on there. I think that's the website that you can also, there's a template to send an email to your local MP supporting the voice. Um, it takes about three or four minutes. So you can jump on there and do that as something constructive. Um, but yeah, so that Yes23, uh, has a lot of resources and we will probably be linking to a lot of those resources rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so yeah, there are some resources there. I'll try and get them put on the, uh, or I will get them put on the Synod website, the First Nations Resources website. Um, I'll probably end up doing an article in Insights that just sort of refers people to those resources. Um, I'm also working with I work quite closely with the United's advocacy team uh, and they've recently got employed a social justice lead, a lady called uh, Holly Thorburn, who's, who's an Aboriginal lady, she's wonderful. So her focus at the moment will be working on advocacy around the Statement for the Heart of the Voice campaign. Um, and Uniting, what my recommendation to Uniting was, was that they put together a hard copy information pack that will be sent out hopefully if we I've, I've got a list I've just got to be careful of how I share that list but I've got a list of contacts for every congregation and presbytery and we will send a hard copy of information out to every congregation and presbytery because I know that for a lot of people the electronic stuff isn't the best form but hopefully if we can get that hard copy that'll have a copy of the Lurie statement we'll have a copy of information about the S campaign or have a probably a frequently asked questions document and some other stuff that will basically collate from other places. It'll probably have information about the assembly's position, uniting's position and the church's position. But yeah, so it'll be a hard copy information pack that hopefully in the next four to six weeks will be sent out as a, an information pack. Yeah. We do listen. I do know the electronic stuff isn't, isn't always the best. And uh, you mentioned um, there were three, I think, objections that um, um, Indigenous activists have put onto the, uh, the voice. Um, uh, conservative politicians have added a couple more. And one of them, which is um, uh, current now, is about coming from people like Greg Craven, that the um, including of the executive in the, that particular clause will um, give rise to legal problems. I, what I read in the paper this morning was something like uh, lawyers at 10 paces. Could you give us some, your view on that in particular? We've got about five minutes. Yeah. So in a nutshell, look, as much as we would like to think it were different, there is still a significant level of racism that exists in this country. It just is. Hopefully not in this room, but certainly in parts, elements of our community. I mean, we have far right people, we just sort of you neo know, Nazi people marching. Um, you know, these these elements exist in our community. Um, you know, I think it would be it would be an imagination to say that 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 sort of thinking doesn't exist in any of our parliamentary you know, representatives. Um, there are there would be people that for their own reasons and you know they, they don't support this and they probably wouldn't support the rights of Aboriginal people in any sense just because of their own personal views on things. 
I think I think this talk about oh there could be high court challenges and there could be I mean how long is a piece of string you know sure someone might lodge a high court challenge they people can lodge a high court challenge over almost anything they want in terms of politics and people doing stuff the high court might say there's nothing to this and throw it out okay so we live in a democracy people have the right to challenge things that's okay but in terms of saying our courts are going to get bogged down in challenges i think my reading the plain reading of this question um, and of what the voice the power that the voice will have the plain reading of that the 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 way that the everyday person would read that it's very clear that the power of the voice is limited <coughs> and that the parliament will have the authority to create essentially and to um, through legislation determine what the power of the voice is and how that works so I don't see it personally from a from a legal I'm not a constitutional lawyer so I can't give and, and I'm not a practicing solicitor so I can't give you legal advice but my personal opinion is that it won't be this this drama that's out to be I, I see this sort of commentary as something like you know Peter Dutton saying oh, I need more detail when he'll be the one that does the detail stuff this this legal position because there are plenty of lawyers plenty of very very smart lawyers who are saying this isn't an issue you know like Albanese, Albanese government is saying there's plenty of detail and the opposition is saying there's not enough detail there are lawyers saying this is fine there's not an issue here <laughs> other lawyers are saying oh but I think there could be an issue I mean it, it's, it's all um it's just oh, I forget what the word but guesswork you know they're, they're guessing that maybe there could be these problems there's no actual evidence substantive evidence that there will be a problem so if and when there might be a challenge to something we're a pretty you know, reasonably smart nation and we've got courts and we've got judges who are pretty smart and they'll work through it not a big deal you know, like our courts work through challenges to all sorts of other things you know there's plenty of other legislation that gets challenged occasionally and you know we, we survive it'll be right As we come to an end of this uh, really wonderful and illuminating session, uh, Nathan, uh, I'd like on, on behalf of Canberra Region Presbytery to, uh, to thank you, uh, Nathan, for, uh, for sharing with us. And I'd like to say it really uh, makes me proud to be part of the United Church. I feel that, uh, as, as Nathan has expressed it, uh, we have a theology that's that's grounded in the gospel and the, the yes vote is very much what in our Christian doctrine. And uh, so uh, sincere thanks Nathan for uh, making the effort to uh, come and speak with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. So, and I will hang around for a little while. So, if anyone wants to come have a chat, please. And before we before we finish, uh, I'd like to uh, move a motion for the the presbytery to consider uh, a proposal regarding the voice. So, uh, I'll read it out for you. Robbie, down the microphone. Okay. The proposal is that the Presbytery thank Nathan Tyson for his clear and illuminating presentation to Presbytery on The Voice. Note that the consistent and strong commitment of the United Church over decades to shaping a destiny together with the people of the First Nations of this country. Note the support for a yes vote in the upcoming referendum that has been expressed by the United Church Australia Assembly and the Synod of New South Wales and the ACT, as well as the board of uniting in this Synod. Support advocacy for a yes vote in the referendum in the coming months. Encourage church councils to consider the issues involved in the voice, to facilitate local conversations about this issue and noting the support of assembly and Synod encourage all members of the church to give serious consideration to the way that they vote in the referendum. Just I'll step in there. Okay. We just need to vote on that. And uh, it's with pleasure that I, I call for the vote. 
Uh, do you know the colour you're going to use? You know the positive colour? I don't know how to describe it. Orange? Yeah. Warm? The orange card is the yes one. If you're not happy, use the blue card and you can register. But we'll follow through on that. And if you're representing, you use the yellow card. Andrew? Uh, just in terms of the voting, as it's an actual presbytery decision, it's those who are members of presbytery who will be asked to vote. Uh, it's not that we don't value other participants here, uh, but just according to our 